What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to week 12 of Entry Point. Uh, this is a uh, course for new screenwriters to designed to get you to the first draft of a screenplay in 15 weeks. And uh, like I said, this is week 12, which is uh, amazing because it, because it puts us four fifths of the way through this class. Uh, and that's kind of wild that we're there already. Uh, I have to say it's been an even more gratifying experience than I could have expected. So thank you very much to all of you who have been participating throughout. It's been really fun. Um, I have actually learned a lot doing this, um, and so it's been cool to experience that and also to kind of just watch all of your own successes and, you know, aha moments as, as you've been getting your writing done uh, and just learning about kind of how stories and movies work. Uh, so uh, we diverged a little bit last week to talk about the business side of things, uh, specifically networking. Today we're going to go ahead and get straight back to craft. Uh, a couple of you already finished your first drafts of your scripts, which is super cool. So um, that's awesome. The majority of you should be somewhere between 40 and 60 pages. Uh, and ideally you're at like around page 50 or so or better. Uh, so first of all, that's a lot of pages. Uh, congratulations. Um, for many of you, it's probably like the longest thing that you've ever written, which is pretty exciting. Um, if you are around that 50 to 60 page mark, it also means that you are right in the middle of Act 2. Uh, and so I thought it would be good to spend a little bit more time on that today. Um, but, you know, first I would be really interested to hear, you know, ha did any of you try uh, the assignment from last week to reach out to five professional screenwriters and see if you could set up a coffee or a meeting or a Zoom or something like that? Uh, how did that go? Let me know. Um, I'd love to hear if you made any connections, if you have anything, you know, on the calendar. Um, you know, how uncomfortable was that? Uh, how, you know, I'd love to hear about the, uh, the process and, and, um, how that experience was for you. I did see a couple people put in the Facebook group that they had meetings scheduled already, which is pretty exciting. Um, really glad that, uh, you stepped outside that comfort zone and went for it and that, uh, it, it resulted in something for you. All right. So Indra has two next week. Wow. That's awesome. That's really exciting. I'm so glad that uh, people did that because I know that that was kind of a uh, uncomfortable thing for a lot of people to do. Um, but I do think, as I said last week, you know, you start meeting people now and it's just like the writing, you know, you put in the time now and just keep investing that over and over again and it will pay off in the long run. Herb has two as well, uh, through an editor you didn't know was a writer. Editing is his day job. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's like another thing is sometimes you don't realize who knows people. Um, and uh, that's why it's just worth talking about what it is that you're doing. Contact two professionals, both responded. Talked to one for one hour. Zoom scheduled for next month with the second. That's so cool. All right, great. I'm so glad uh, that... Uh, you know, this is working uh, and uh, that you, you are doing it and uh, just making those connections. I think that uh, you're going to find that that type of thing just pays off and uh, is also just really inspiring and motivating in the long run. So, uh, oh, and uh, also Rebecca reached out to a few waiting here, did meet three screenwriters this week. Uh, they were existing connections, so invaluable, but doesn't technically count. Sure, but still valuable, right? Um, and also, by the way, this was a holiday week, so I realized that that is going to trip things up as well. Uh, I hope you all had a great holiday for uh, those of you who are in the States and celebrating Thanksgiving as well. Um, so let's hear how it's going with your pages. Um, how many have you written? How are you feeling about them? Are you enjoying yourself, hating the process? Um, you know, what's your uh, confidence level that you are going to finish at this point? I would love to hear that too. And uh, for those of you who've already finished, I know that's a couple of you. I would love to hear how you celebrated because it's something that's totally worth celebrating. It's a huge, huge deal to finish a feature screenplay. Um, like I've been saying kind of all along, a lot of people wish that they would do it and want to do it, but just kind of never actually sit down to do the thing. And you are doing the thing and some of you have already done it. So it's pretty awesome. Third act seems a little bit abrupt. That can happen. Um, that happens to me sometimes. Uh, sometimes you know, you're fleshing out the first act and second act. It kind of leads to things that create more opportunities for payoffs in the third act. Um, and sometimes really seeking out that crisis moment for the protagonist can be helpful too. I'm stuck in early second act. So today's topic should be useful. Yes, I think it will be. Um, a little over 50 pages in, just past the midpoint. Cool. Great. You're right on schedule. 
Managed to double the hard work from last week, from two pages to four. Still 100% confident I'll finish on time. Fantastic. How's it going for the rest of you? Hopefully we all clicked the like button. Still muddling along at seven pages, but you're getting pages done. Progress got Thanksgiving this week, still on page 30. Totally reasonable, right? Like, I mean, there are going to be weeks where you're not getting things done because of family obligations and things like that, which, uh, you know, I think family should take priority. Um, so, you know, you just, you've got other weeks to catch up. Um, 30 pages, it's slow. Uh, scenes weren't working, so I redid them. Once I got a uh, scene, they seemed to flow more easily. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so just remember, including today, you got four more weeks worth of assignments, uh, four more weeks worth of writing. So, like, if you did kind of the max, the 15 pages uh, per week, you got 60 pages that way. Uh, and you can always go a little bit over that too. Um, and if you stay on pace, you will have finished the screenplay before the end of the year. Um, should be a really nice feeling as you move into the holidays. Uh, and so I want that for you. And I'm challenging you to do what you need to do to just buckle down and get it done. Uh, it's totally a great feeling. And uh, you've put in the work this far. So just keep going. Um, and I'm very confident that you'll be able to pull it off. So let's talk about second acts. For those of you who are in the second act and still struggling with it, which is common, um, often, you know, people think of the second act as kind of the hardest part of a script. Uh, and in a way, that's definitely true. Um, it's certainly the biggest part. Uh, and also, we spend, you know, so much time figuring out the setup and the ending and our outlines, uh, and we're often less sure about what's going to happen in the middle of the movie. But, you know, here's the thing. The middle of the movie is the movie. You know, if you think about Jurassic Park, when they first see the dinosaurs, that's an act two. The scenes with the T-Rex and the Jeeps, act two. The scene with the dinosaur blowing snot all over them, uh, that's act two. The scene on the electric fence and the power going out, act two. Uh, in The Matrix, we don't even really see The Matrix uh, and everything behind it until we get into act two. That's literally us moving into act two is when we get to see behind the curtain there. Um, and, you know, all the moments that we remember from that movie, almost all of those are in Act 2. Act 2 is full of trailer moments. It's where you show off your concept. So, you know, if you think about it in that way and kind of reframe it, sometimes it can just be helpful in order to work toward figuring out what you need to do with it. Um, if you remember from the previous class, you know, many writers think of Act 2 as two parts. So like they're separated by a midpoint, which is often a big reversal that also serves as a point of no return. Uh, in the simplest terms, you've got Act 2A, and the protagonist in Act 2A is kind of having a little bit of fun and seemingly making progress toward their goal. There's some obstacles, but they're, they're doing all right. Then the midpoint has a direct impact on that progress, um, and they begin to find themselves getting beat up a whole lot more in Act 2B. But, you know, let's dive into that further and keep breaking it down. Um, when we talked about theme, we did break it down a little bit more. So in the first part of Act 2A, the protagonist is going after their goal, doing pretty well, and they're kind of still living according to the anti-theme that they had embraced in the first act and don't really feel the need to change because things are going okay as they're proceeding toward their goal. Second part of Act 2A, uh, after they've had kind of like a hiccup, uh, the theme gets introduced and they get just a glimpse of its truth. But then the midpoint happens, it's often directly related to their flaw, and then the and the anti-theme, and you know, as a result, they kind of double down on that anti-theme in the first part of Act 2B until they hit rock bottom, realize the truth of the theme, and embrace it at the end of Act 2, which moves them into Act 3. Um, actually, there are like really useful plot points that writers tend to use between all of these segments. So let's talk about them. So um, roughly, uh, and by the way, these are like not exact page numbers that you need to stick to. Um, but roughly the following plot points happen at the following time. So around page 45, we often get, what, get what's referred to as the pinch point, uh, where the stakes of the movie increase even further. Around page 60, we get to that aforementioned midpoint. Around page 75 or so, we get to a low point where the protagonist hits rock bottom. And then at around page 85, we break into act three. 
I'm just checking comments here real quick. Uh, oh, cool. More updates on what people are doing. Great. Um, okay, so let's break out our three scripts uh, that we've been using for several recent classes and look at all these points. So if you don't already have them up, um, you know, it's Get Out, Die Hard, Little Miss Sunshine. They can be found at the websites on this slide. Again, not every story has exactly these beats that I just talked about. Um, you can write stories in lots of different ways. But in terms of just kind of what we typically see in narrative three act structure, especially in a lot of like, you know, Hollywood movies, genre movies, um, you know, ones that are targeted at large audiences, you see these points play out quite often. Um, and that even and when I say things targeted at large audiences, like I kind of mean Little Miss Sunshine too. Even that, although it's got that, you know, fun, quirky indie feel to it, like it's it's an accessible movie. Um, and so a lot of accessible movies hit this kind of same structure and they hit those same beats. Um, so let's talk about that first one, the pinch point. So um, that is in the middle of Act 2A. Uh, and, you know, it's often called the pinch point. But basically all you need to remember is that this is a point where the stakes of the movie are raised. So you can go ahead and call it the stake raiser or whatever else you want to call it. It's not as big of an oh shit moment as the midpoint is, but it's still an oh shit moment. Um, it keeps our characters on their toes. It contributes to their arc. And most importantly, because uh, you know that's largely the point of what we're doing here, it keeps the audience engaged and just on the edge of their seats. So if you go to Get Out and just go to page 41, we get a really great pinch point there. So Chris has sat down with his girlfriend's mother, Missy. She's uh, kind of pressured him into doing some hypnosis to solve his smoking habit. Uh, it seems normal enough, like kind of weird for sure, but like, you know, nothing too sketchy about it um, until suddenly the empathetic expression on her face twists into a sick smile and she tells him to sink into the floor. Uh, and from his perspective, that is exactly what happens there. He falls into this dark abyss sees through his eyes like some tiny window that's way above him. He has no control over his body. He's paralyzed. It's this great, horrific, cinematic, unique moment. And it tells us that things are about to get a whole lot worse for our protagonist because this is by far the wildest thing that we've seen in the movie yet. And after two more pages of like this horror, Chris wakes up and he has no direct memory of what happened, but he has this general awareness that something is really wrong. And so the stakes of the movie have been elevated and now we're able to keep going. In Die Hard, uh, John has been trying to get the attention of the authorities. First, you know, he tried the firemen, they got turned around. Next, he called 911, they were skeptical, but they finally sent Sergeant Powell to, to, to uh, check things out. If you go to page 43, Powell has gone inside the building. He has talked to the terrorist who was posing as a security guard and, you know, decided that things looked okay. John watches as Powell goes back to his car, only realizing that he's about to lose his only lifeline to the authorities. Uh, and so what does he do? Uh, on page 44, John drops a body from the towering building above onto Powell's car. Uh, so Powell floors the car in reverse, backing into a storefront, and it's just this like great, fun, again, cinematic moment. Uh, and now the cops know what's going on. Now they're involved. So the stakes have been raised and they've been raised for the terrorists, which raises the stakes for John. Uh, and you might think like this is a good thing for John, but it's not because it, it ultimately makes things harder because the guy that's leading the charge for the cops isn't on John's side at all. And he ends up creating more obstacles for John as we go. Um, in Little Miss Sunshine, if you go to page 44, so Richard has created this big nine step program about winning. That is his thing, right? Uh, and he's got this agent type guy who's told him that he can sell it for really big money. Richard has thrown everything into this. Uh, the family is strapped for cash as a result, and like they need this program to sell big and pay off. So on page 44, Richard gets on the phone with his agent guy, Stan Grossman, after having not been able to reach him for a little bit. And he finds out that the program didn't sell. And when he tells his wife Cheryl this on page 45, she's furious and he is humiliated because his whole thing has been about winning and selling this program. And he's been telling all of that she needs to be a winner if she's gonna go and do this beauty pageant. And so it sets up the stakes in a big way for him because now he risks looking like a loser and that's in front of the, the daughter of his who he's been telling needs to win. And now her winning is all the more important to him 
because it will at least allow him some way in which he can win as well. So um, we've raised the stakes around page 45, like I said, uh, forcing our protagonist to take new actions. Now we need to do this again, but we need to do it in a way that's much bigger. So we're gonna talk about the midpoint. Um, many times the midpoint is called a point of no return because it's the place where the protagonist can no longer go back. Um, and this reversal means that they must continue on their journey and press toward their goal for better or for worse. So um, let's see how these movies approach the midpoint. So, um, oh, and by the way, uh, the midpoint isn't usually smack dab like in the middle of the movie. Uh, it is usually kind of close, but it's more like in the exact middle of the second act uh, because the first act tends to be longer than the third act. So it's like skewed a little bit. Um, so, you know, if you've got a script that's 100 to 110 pages, page 60 is about where it lands. Um, and again, these are like rough estimates. So if yours isn't exactly there, it doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong with it. It's just kind of typically what happens with the structure of a movie. So anyway, in Get Out, if you go to page 62, the Armitages are hosting a party at their place. And it's been pretty awkward for Chris. Uh, tons of like subtle and not so subtle racism. Lots of microaggressions. Uh, he's asked about the black experience by one of these party goers and then Logan or the guy that was formerly known as Andre and who got captured like in the first five pages of the movie, he approaches. Um, Chris and him already met earlier and he seems super strange now and he's the only black guy at the party aside from him and his friend Rod told him to snap a picture of this guy. So Chris tries to snap a picture with his phone like really nice and subtle but his flash goes off and that flash stuns Andre and his face shifts to one of horror. And on page 63, he tells Chris to get out. Like this is our, our big trailer mo moment. Um, he tells Chris to get out, shouts for him to get the fuck out of there. And you know, it's just this great wild moment that affirms for Chris that things are at this house are not okay. And it shifts his whole thinking about everything in a very real and significant way that leads to everything that's gonna go from there. Um, in Die Hard, we go to page 72. Um, this is a 125 page script. So, you know, unsurprisingly, the midpoint's a little bit later. Uh, friendly reminder, do not submit a 125 page script anywhere. Uh, it just won't get read. Aim for 115 or shorter. But anyway, that's where we are in Die Hard. Page 72. So the cops uh, got involved thanks to that pinch point, but they're not working with John or listening to him. And so They've tried to lay siege and they've played right into what the terrorists want. And now the terrorists are firing at them. John needs a way to disrupt everything. So what does he do? He drops some C4 down an elevator shaft and causes a massive explosion in the building. It's a huge action set piece that looks amazing on camera, but more importantly, it ups the ante in some really huge ways. So first of all, the terrorists have shown the cops that they're in charge. Second, uh, Robinson, who's in charge of the cops, now hates John even more. Third, Hans is more out to get John than ever. And fourth, and this is really important, Ellis realizes the danger of the situation and he decide, he's going to decide as a result of this that he needs to tell Hans who John is. So all of this is really, really bad for John. And Little Miss Sunshine, go right to exactly page 60. Grandpa has died at the hospital. Richard is obviously really upset about this. He is now, you know, um, lost the sale of his huge program that he's been working on and kind of invested everything into and now his dad is dying on top of it but also this is going to cause them to miss the pageant and they've driven 700 miles to get to this point and he has had two incredibly brutal things happen in the last 24 hours uh and you know he, everything has just kind of been crushed for him and he decides right then and there that they are not going to miss this pageant and by page 62 they're stealing grandpa's body and they're on their way back to the pageant and if Richard is willing to do that, to get all of to the pageant on time to win, then we, that kind of telegraphs to the audience that there is no possible way that he's going back at this point. Part of what often makes um, the midpoint a true point of no return is also that it changes the protagonist's relationship with the antagonistic force of the movie, uh, which is why some of the obstacles tend to get bigger in the second half of act two. So, you know, if we go back to get out again, this moment with Andre, makes it clear to Chris that something is really wrong. Uh, and just as importantly, it puts the Armitages off balance. So like this happened in front of them and the entire point of the party was for them to, you know, basically present Chris to all these people who were gonna bid on him and sell him to the highest bidder for obscene money. 
And if he runs because of this, they have a huge problem on their hands. So now they're forced to act more decisively and more swiftly. In Die Hard, like I said, it not only results in Hans um, being more out to get John than ever, but now Hans learns John's identity and that raises the stakes big time. In Little Miss Sunshine, Grandpa has died. Olive told him how much she didn't want to disappoint her dad by losing right before that happened. Grandpa gave her great advice, but now Grandpa's dead and her dad is more dead set than ever on getting her to the pageant so that she can win. And Richard is kind of like her philosophical antagonist of this movie. So it makes things even harder for her to kind of come out and just be who she wants to be. On the same note, because Richard has lost two very significant things in his life now and losing is kind of his antagonistic force, his stakes have also been really heightened as a result of that. Um, in movies that center around romance um, or have a big romantic angle where the opposite romantic lead is often the antagonistic force or at least one of them, uh, writers often refer to the midpoint as sex at 60. Uh, if you watch nearly any romantic comedy or romance, you'll notice that the protagonists or um, the leads, they have sex at around 60 minutes in or at least like they have a romantic kiss or something. Um, and this creates a point of no return for the relationship because you've had all this building and building and building to this point, And then that happens and like the relationship is going to go one way or another. It's going to end well or badly, but they're probably not going to forget about each other at this point. So it's a point of no return for them. Um, and finally, keeping to uh, that last point in mind, the midpoint is just about always a big genre moment as well. So it's scary and unsettling and get out. It's explosive and die hard, and it's both hilarious and dramatic in Little Miss Sunshine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a sex at 60. It's a real thing. Like if you Google it, like you'll, you'll see it's a thing. I think it gets talked about less often these days, but like it's a term that gets thrown around writing circles. Um, okay, so let's talk about the low point. Um, you have finished writing your midpoint. Uh, you've made it through the first half of Act 2, which is awesome. Congratulations. Uh, and now things are going to get even harder for your protagonist. Uh, so much so that you are going to drag them straight down to rock bottom because, you know, you're a writer, which makes you an awful human being. Um, so this happens roughly page 75 to 80. Uh, but again, let me stress that, like, it's just a, you know, a guideline that a type of thing that typically happens with these narrative structures. And Get Out, it's on page 72. Uh, Chris discovers pictures of Rose with a bunch of other black boyfriends. She told him that he was the first black guy that she ever dated. And like things in this house are really sketchy. He's, you know, ready to get out of there. He's asking her to help him get out. And then he finds out that actually she's in on this too. And like it, she's just super psychotic and something is really wrong. And his vanity has allowed him to be blind to this uh, and to love this completely messed up woman. And now there's just no denying it. He tries to leave, but by page 74, the family has him trapped inside. And Dean gives him a speech about the purpose in life and sacrifice, and we realize how unhinged and crazy he is. And then Missy taps her teacup on page 75. And Chris suddenly drops, falls, and finds himself in that black hole. He is screwed, and in those three pages, he's realized his girlfriend's psychotic. Uh, he's come face to face with his own flaw and blindness to reality. And he's been sent to a literal rock bottom, which is the sunken place. Uh, <laughs> well, it doesn't need to be happening, Indra. Like I said, these are just, you know, things that typically happen and they're useful guidelines. But like, you know, stories are told in different ways. So it doesn't mean that something's wrong. Um, but it's something that's useful to know. Um, anyway, uh, in Die Hard, uh, since the midpoint, Ellis has now given Hans John's name. Uh, and then Ellis got himself killed when he thought he could negotiate with Hans and get John to come in. Hans then told John that if he didn't come in, he was going to keep shooting and he gave him a deadline. John, his feet are now bleeding from broken glass, is trying to form some kind of plan. He starts reloading a magazine, talking to Powell while he does, and we learn about how Sergeant Powell stopped working in the street after he shot a kid. And it feels like a dark moment already. And then the terrorists see John and they capture him on page 89 and they take him up to the roof to get their detonators. John has blown it. Uh, and this moment plays a little bit later in Die Hard because it is just a little bit longer than you would expect of your typical script. Um, the movie, though, actually takes this low point even further and structures it a little differently. And I think it's better because it brings more threads of the story and theme together to make this low point even lower, 
which makes the emotional arc of the overall movie even stronger. Um, in the movie, John ran into Hans upstairs, but he didn't know that he was Hans, and Hans pretended to be a hostage, and John pretended to buy it, even giving Hans a gun to help protect himself. Um, but, you know, if, as we all know from having seen the movie, uh, when Hans tries to shoot John, it turns out it's unloaded and John outsmarted him. Um, and by the way, in the script, they had a very similar scene, but much earlier in the movie, and it was with a different terrorist. It was a really great decision, in my opinion, to, to uh, move it to here and sub in Hans, because it's a great moment where we feel like John is about to win right before we take him back down a peg. And it also keeps us focused on that relationship between John and Hans. But then Carl and another, another terrorist shows up and he and Hans work together to shoot out a bunch of windows, forcing John to run across them barefoot. Now his feet get all cut up. It's another nice change for the movie. It's a little bit more cinematic and explosive. Um, John does escape, but now he's hurt. Uh, and we cut away quickly to learn that reporters have now found out all sorts of information about John, his job, his badge number, and most importantly, that his family lives right there in LA. Uh, and as an audience, we realize that's really not good because now Holly can be in danger if Hans finds that out. And uh, immediately after learning that, we see the terrorists have managed to break through the first section of the vault. And Hans tells them that he's got a miracle that'll take care of the rest. And then now, now John is dragging himself into the bathroom, feet bleeding all to hell. All of this has happened. He's pulling glass out of his feet and he's on the radio with Powell now. And Powell tells him about his whole thing about shooting the kid. Um, and then just to make things worse, after John tells Powell that he's feeling like shit, Powell says, well, this won't matter. Then this won't matter. We're not calling the shots anymore. And we learn that the feds are now in charge. So all, it's just like boom, 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 all in the space of a couple pages. All these things have been kind of taken away from John or adding fuel to the fire to put him in you know, the lowest possible way or point. And, you know, he doesn't get taken hostage in this version, but he doesn't need to be because of the way it's crafted. It hits hard emotionally and it's setting us up for a really solid shift as we move into act three. It's also a slow moment, which is a really nice chance to catch our breath in a high octane action movie and to really sit with like these important character beats. Uh, and importantly, that revelation about the feds changes things, creating another turning point that's going to propel the movie forward. In Little Miss Sunshine, we get to a low point right on schedule, but it's actually delivered in kind of an interesting way um, using the strength of the ensemble in this movie. So Grandpa's died. His body is literally in the back of their VW van, uh, and they've decided to press forward to the pageant anyway. Uh, they've come this far. But then Dwayne, Olive's brother, finds out that he's colorblind on page 71. And on page 72, Frank, his uncle, tells him that means he can't fly fighter jets. And that's a dream he cares about so desperately that he has taken a vow of silence for months in order to work toward achieving this. We watch Dwayne crumple as he gets the news. Frank yells for Richard to pull over. And when he does, on page 73, Dwayne gets out of the van and we hear him yell, fuck. And this is the first time we've seen him speak the entire length of the movie. Um, it's super effective. It's a brutal moment. And interestingly, because Richard is so intensely focused on the pageant and all of winning, he barely feels it at this point. Instead of giving his son time to process the loss, he's tapping his watch and he's saying to his wife that they got to get going. But then after a couple seconds, Cheryl prods Dwayne too. And then on page 74, Dwayne freaks out at everybody. He tells them they're not his family. He calls them all losers. And he points out the things that make them exactly that. It's not only like incredibly harsh and cutting, it's exactly the thing that Richard is terrified of being a loser. Um, and you know, it's his son calling him that. So it's just a really, really harsh moment. And then finally, in something that's kind of like a tiny acknowledgement of his flaw, Richard asks Olive if she'll talk to Dwayne because he knows that they connect in a way that Dwayne and he do not. Uh, and because she isn't fo as laser focused on winning as he is. And on page 75, Olive just does a simple thing and sits down to, next to Dwayne and puts, his, puts her arm on his shoulder. And in a second, he gets up, apologizes for what he said, and they all get back into the van, but with a few less minutes on an already ticking clock. So again, you'll notice that this is a moment where the action slows down to kind of let us feel like the brutality of these characters coming to terms with their situations and their flaws. And in addition to that, it's all, it's usually directly followed by a beat that moves us 
forward. Also, um, you know, it's often often there's some sort of death at this point. In many movies, um, the literal death of a character leads us right into this rock bottom moment. Um, or it happens at like the exact same time. And it's a super effective way to achieve those feelings. In these three examples, it's actually a little different. You know, so like we in Get Out, Chris goes to the sunken place and it's kind of like a psychological death of himself. Um, in Die Hard, the low point is punctuated by the way Powell tells the story of this 13-year-old kid he shot. And we feel that story, especially because of the timing of it. And then in Little Miss Sunshine, it's the death of, of Dwayne's dream that brings him to the point of calling everybody losers. But if you watch movies and kind of pay attention to this point, you'll see a lot of people die around like minute 75 to 80. Um, Olive sitting with Dwayne is also a callback to when Dwayne told her to sit with her uh, mom. That's a great point. Uh, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. That's like a, that was a really kind of great setup that just makes that moment uh, feel even a little bit stronger and, and pack more emotional punch. So that's, that's a good call out. Nice. Um, so, okay. So you have successfully been mean to your characters now. Uh, they've hit rock bottom and they've come face to face with their flaw, but that's not good enough. Uh, now you're going to use this moment to motivate them to get back on their feet and complete their arc and do some things. And this is what tends to happen at the plot point where we break into act three. So, uh, sometimes we refer to this moment as the act two climax. Um, and that definitely works in the sense that like, it's often the height of dramatic and emotional tension at this point kind of the way that we defined Climax a couple classes ago. Um, there are often also big genre related set pieces involved, but not always, there don't have to be because most importantly, this moment is about completing the character's arc or like getting close to that point where they're acknowledging their flaw and getting your protagonist ready for the final showdown in act three. So sometimes you move from the low point to this moment almost immediately. Uh, sometimes it takes an entire sequence to get there. Um, either can totally be okay, but with both, it's important to have this extra plot point before you move into the third act. And because the third acts are often around 20 pages or so, we're probably hitting this point like page 85-ish. Uh, but again, depending on the script, this might happen as early as page 75 or as late as page 100, with you still hitting that industry standard of kind of like 90 to 115 pages for your entire screenplay. Uh, and these page numbers are just rough guidelines. So in Get Out, the break into act three really does happen like kind of right out of the low point. Um, Chris goes to that sunken place. We watch Rose and their family kind of talk like hanging above his POV, um, like he's not even there as they drag him down into the basement where we've never been before. Um, and I want to talk about that for a second. So like, even though we're spending almost the entire movie in this one house, we're still getting this cinematic benefit of going to a brand new location because we have never been in the basement uh, right in the beginning of act two, when Dean uh, Rose's dad was giving Chris a tour of the house. He even mentioned the basement and said, Oh, it's sealed off. We're having mold problems down there, whatever. And it's kind of like this, you know, innocuous thing at that point, but we've never been down there. And now we have this sense of forward progress because we're going to this whole new place. Um, and that's a really important thing. Before we do see the basement, we cut to Chris's friend, Rod, who unable to get in touch with Chris, he has the idea to Google Andre. And since Chris told him he saw him at the party, he sees that Andre has been missing, you know, for some time. And this makes him realize that things are incredibly bad for his friend and his friend needs help. And also, even though this is a beat that's not directly driven by our protagonist, it still feels really appropriate because it was Chris's actions involving taking a photo of Andre and sending it to Rod that resulted in Rod doing this. In Die Hard, the movie and script diverge pretty wildly here. Uh, so I'm just going to focus on the movie because that's what I did when I referenced these points in the last classes. Um, and I think these were important state or changes that have helped the movie kind of stand the test of time. So John's hurt. He's at his low point. Powell has just informed him that the FBI is now in charge. This is a really bad thing. Um, the FBI's protocol is to shut down the building's power. And this plays right into Hans's plan allowing them to get access to the final part of the vault, underscoring how much smarter he is than the authorities. Uh, and just as importantly, there's a shift in terms of John's goal here. His initial approach was kind of to hold out until the authorities could help, but they've proven completely useless. And now the FBI has taken over and made things worse. Meanwhile, the movie kind of teases out his low point 
uh, because John's telling Powell how he never got to tell his wife how sorry he is. And he asks Powell to do that for him. And that's the completion of his arc where he was really recognizing his flaw. It's an emotionally tense moment. Powell tells John he needs to tell his wife he's sorry himself. John says that's up to the man upstairs. And then something occurs to him. He realized, oh, I saw I saw Hans upstairs. And that doesn't make sense to him. He tells Powell to lay off for a while. He's going to go check on something. And then boom, we're moving into Act 3. In Little Miss Sunshine, we get a really climactic end to Act 2. Uh, you know, they're driving over medians and whipping through parking lots and crashing through gates because they're short on time to get to the deadline um, for the pageant. They do get there and they're four minutes late and the pageant official won't let them sign up. And it's crushing for everybody involved, especially for Richard and Olive, uh, who have so much hanging on this pageant, emotionally speaking. But then and a guy who's assisting there offers to sign them in on page 81. It's a moment of relief and we're ready to move into Act 3, which is basically just the pageant. Um, the completion of Richard's and Olive's arcs actually doesn't perfectly coincide with the act break, by the way, which is a good example of like, there are different ways to tell stories. Um, Olive's comes close though. And as we spoke about a couple weeks ago, there's a really good reason for holding back on Richard's here with Olive, just as she gets signed in on page 81, she sees Miss Florida's there and she wants to meet her on page 85. She does. She asks Miss Florida if she eats ice cream because her dad told her that pageant winners probably don't eat much of it since they want to stay thin. And she's elated to learn that Miss Florida does eat ice cream. And it's a pivotal moment where she kind of realizes she can be who she wants to be and still compete and have fun in these pageants. Um, with Richard, because he's kind of the thematic antagonist of the movie, uh, he needs to remain flawed right up until the completion of his own arc and the crisis moment at the end. Uh, and so that's what ends up happening with him. But, you know, we most often see the completion of our characters' arcs at this point, or at the very least, like, an acceptance of their flaws. Uh, and that's what kind of helps them propel into the third act or the end of the movie. Um, and often, just like in these three examples, there is a location change. So, as I said in Get Out, we went to the basement. In Die Hard, we go to the roof for the first time. That was also a nice shift from uh, the script to the movie, because in the script, we'd been there much earlier. But now it feels like this whole new location. And then in Little Miss Sunshine, we're now at the pageant. Um, this gives the movie just that feeling of forward momentum and suggests that there will be an outcome one way or another. And there's also a feeling of the protagonist getting prepped for the final showdown as we move from Act 2 to Act 3. So just kind of watch for those moments as well. So um, you've got your four plot points for the second act. Um, you know, but... Like, what are plot points other than just emotionally charged joints that join sections of a movie together? You know, what do you do with all those pages in between? Because there are a lot of them. Uh, they should not feel like filler. That's how you lose a reader and how you lose an audience really quickly. So remember how, like, way early on in this course, we spoke about the importance of active characters, especially your protagonist and your antagonist. Um, well, one of the best things that you can do uh, to make all these pages between your plot points feel energetic and fun is to think of them as like their own mini movies with their own mini goals, or as we often like to call them, sequences. Uh, you don't have to do this, but it's a really good way to approach it. And as the characters face progressive obstacles and take action to overcome them, these just flow into the next plot point. So let's use Little Miss Sunshine as an example because it does a fair bit of this. So to recap... Uh, on page 26, we moved from Act 1 to Act 2, uh, where Richard said, we're going to Florida after he convinces Olive that she needs to, you know, compete to win if she's going to do this. Page 44, he gets the news that he's unable to sell his nine-step winning program and he's humiliated in front of his wife and family. Page 60, Grandpa's died. Uh, page 62, Richard has them steal the body so they can make it back into the van and make it back, uh, to, or make it back to the pageant on time. Page 74, Dwayne has found out he's colorblind. His dream of being a fighter pilot is not going to happen. He tells the family they're a bunch of losers. Page 81, they've made it to the pageant, and a guy takes pity on them and signs them in. Okay, so cool. So again, all these plot points, they raise the stakes of the movie, and they propel it toward its ending. Uh, and you might notice that the number of pages between plot points actually grows a little smaller each time. Uh, this is pretty common, and it's a subtle way of accelerating the pace of the movie with each of those sequences getting shorter. 
The first stretch from the point uh, where we break in act two uh, to the pinch point is kind of our intro to the second act and to the meat of the movie. Uh, we get our bearings here. We get introduced to the obstacles, but everything still feels pretty light, like our characters will be able to deal with it. And as a result, it seems like they'll be able to achieve their goal just fine while living according to the anti-theme, just as they were in the first act. Uh, in Little Miss Sunshine, these pages are largely about Richard trying to keep his family on track as they begin their road trip. So Grandpa's kind of like this wild, vulgar pain in the ass, but Richard can deal with that. Um, they get to a diner and he's trying to keep Olive in the mindset of being a pageant winner, telling her not to eat ice cream. His family works against him a little here, but to some degree, he still feels like he's made his point because uh, Olive takes it to heart. And then the clutch on their bus goes, but Richard's a winner and he's not going to let that derail him. He finds out from the mechanic that they can start their van in third as long as they keep it over 15 miles an hour. And this leads them to push starting it for the rest of the movie. Um, it's an obstacle, yes, but it's also fun and it's easy enough to overcome. All right, so cool. How does this flow into the pinch point where Richard finds out that his program isn't going to sell? Well, as soon as they figure out they can still make things work with the van by push starting it, Richard's feeling pretty good. Uh, and he starts bragging to Frank about his nine step program, which is sure to sell for a lot of money and change their lives forever. And Frank gives him a little shit about it. And Richard tells him how sarcasm is the refuge of losers, just doubling down on his ideal. And that is right when Richard gets the call from Stan Grossman, the call that he's been waiting for since the movie started, where he finds out that the movie or the program isn't going to sell and he is humiliated in front of his family. And that set up right before him where he's feeling like a winner who overcame the van's mechanical issues and he's now bragging about his program. It makes that moment hit all that much harder and it just flows. Um, so we've got that done now. And now, you know, we got to get from the pinch point to the midpoint. So uh, Richard still has to get his family to the pageant. Uh, that goal has not gone away, but something else has ha is on his mind now. He's just been humiliated. You know, and he's this guy who is all about winning and he's been made to appear like a loser in front of his daughter who he's trying to show how important winning is. Uh, he can't let that stand. And so this sequence is largely revolving around that and his goal to kind of like get back on his feet and show that he's a winner again. So Michael Arndt starts this sequence out with a really brilliant moment right out of the gate. Um, as a result of the news that Richard gets, the tension is super high. Cheryl and him are fighting and he just wants to get on the road to try and forget about it a bit. So he hurries everybody along and they wind up leaving Olive at the gas station. Uh, and they realize this almost immediately and they double back to pick her up, you know, never able to dip below 15 miles per hour. Uh, so it's a great, you know, funny moment of levity after that super dramatic hit. Um, and it allows us to catch our breath and move forward. Um, and by the way, it's often a great mix, a great move to kind of like mix things up and let everybody breathe a little bit um, and, you know, add a little bit of levity or change up the emotion after the pinch point and after various plot points. It lets people catch their breath. But this moment also does something really important for Richard's arc. It highlights that right now, whether he wins or loses is actually taking precedence in his mind over his daughter, the very daughter that he's driving 800 miles to a beauty pageant. And this is important because the next sequence is going to test his relationship to the theme and to his character flaw of putting winning above everything. Um, good, I'm glad you're enjoying the session. Um, so like right after they pick Olive up again, his, his uh, father, Grandpa, tells Richard that he's proud of him for at least trying to do something big and put himself out there. This is a beat that exposes Richard to the theme directly. And despite his own flaws, Grandpa is kind of very much the mentor figure in this movie that demonstrates that theme. Um, and Richard tries to dismiss this, but Grandpa won't let it go. And Richard ends up shaking hands with him over this beat. And even if it's small, we can see that it means something to him. And it's the very first crack in that armor that's preventing him from seeing the truth of things. And this is something that happens a lot in this very sequence in every movie where like the protagonist gets a little bit crack in that armor, uh, you know, learning just a little bit about their flaw, being faced with the theme and kind of starting to see, okay, maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. And on that very same note, by the way, later on when they get to the motel, Olive tells Grandpa that she's scared about the pageant because she doesn't want to let her dad down. Grandpa tells Olive that she's a winner simply because she's willing to try, regardless of whether she technically wins or loses. Olive is comforted by this, and once again, the movie's theme is demonstrated. But 
Also at the motel and in the same sequence, not long after this happens, Richard and Cheryl have a big fight because Cheryl trusted Richard when he said this program would sell for sure and they bet a lot on it. And now they're in like dire straits financially. Cheryl doesn't know what they're gonna do and she tells Richard she never wants to hear about the nine steps again. And that does it for him. So Richard decides to fix things. But, and he is back on the anti-theme. But the VW bus isn't gonna work for him. Uh, so he, he ends up paying a teen for a moped because you know, this is a funny movie after all. He hops on that at night, rides all the way to Stan Grossman at his hotel. He finds Stan, demands to know what's happened, and he demands to know what the problem was. And Stan tells him the uncomfortable truth. The problem is Richard. Stan can't sell Richard. And it's over, and it's rough, it's brutal. Richard's still stubborn enough to kind of like tell Stan that he blew it, and he storms up off and leaves. But he's got to ride home in a thunderstorm. And then the next morning, before he's had any sleep, Olive shows up at his bedside, Grandpa won't wake up, he's OD'd. And then it gets even worse for Grandpa because at the hospital, or for, sorry, it gets worse for Richard because at the hospital, they're waiting on news for Grandpa. Cheryl calls a family meeting and tells everybody that because of what happened with Richard's program, they may have to declare bankruptcy. They might have to sell their house and move. She reminds them that they still have each other and that's what, what's important. But the truth of it is she's hurting and she breaks down and she starts to cry. And it's a low, low moment for Richard. Uh, we've got him nearly rock bottom already, and now we're ready for Grandpa to actually die. Uh, and as Richard finds out about all of the like post-mortem paperwork that he needs to do after that happens, he realizes they're not going to make it to the pageant in time, and he just can't allow that to happen. Not after he's been humiliated in this way. He must show Olive he's going to get her there one way or another, and so they steal Grandpa's body. All right, so that grandpa dying and that humiliation and stealing grandpa's body, that's that point of no return, right? That's that point of no return. Um, so Richard, was, you know, he was just a check-in. He was doing well in the first act, living life according to the anti-theme, and right before that pinch point happened. And then his dad's kind words came along and he kind of flirted that theme for a second, but then he realized like how much he'd let his family down. So he kind of, went back to try and fix things. And now all this has happened and he is doubling down on what he believes in the importance of winning and the importance of making sure that everybody knows that. So now they're back on the road with grandpa's body in the back. The overall second act goal is still the same. It hasn't changed. They need to get to the pageant, but the sequence here has actually an added element to it. We learn kind of right at the beginning of this, as soon as they're back in the VW bus, that it's now 11.30 a.m. They got to get to the pageant by 3 p.m. and they got to cover 200 miles in that time. It is going to be really, really, really close. There's little room for error and a much more prevalent ticking clock has been added. Um, and obviously that means that they need more obstacles in their way. So in this sequence, Richard blares the horn at somebody in his impatience and then the horn just keeps honking and automatically it's, and it won't stop. And it's funny, but it's also an obstacle because a cop pulls them over because of it. And they have a body in the back of their van, so this is bad. Uh, and thankfully, you know, the cop ends up leaving because grandpa's porn distracts him. Um, but they've lost precious minutes, and now the tension's even higher. And now that it's even higher, this is the perfect time for Dwayne to discover that he's colorblind, leading us to that low point that we just talked about, um, and absolutely just kind of creating this brutal moment where Richard's own kid tells him that he is a absolute loser. Um, and now we're ready to head toward act three. So we've hit our low point and, uh, now we, the pages really just need to get us to act three. Uh, the stakes have been raised higher than they've ever been because now as a result of Dwayne also getting out of the van and sidetracking them, they're actually running behind. Uh, and so we have, you know, this whole like sequence where, they're running late, they know it, and they're driving over medians and all sorts of crazy stuff is happening. Stakes are higher than they've been. There's a philosophical change that's beginning to take place in our, protagonist, our protagonists and in all of our characters. And something that's kind of cool about it is that, you know, as a result of every single person in this family now losing something, they all have a huge stake in getting this pageant on time and in all of winning the pageant. They're all looking for this. And so when they get to the pageant and the pageant official tells them that they can't check her in, 
every single one of them feels that moment a lot. And all of this, all of these sequences, everything that's been done throughout this, where every single character has lost something, has built right to that moment. And that's why that moment when they're told that they can't check in plays so well. And also why it feels so good when the assistant says, oh, you know what? We'll actually take care of it for you. And then we're ready for act three. Um, so, sorry, one second. I just lost my place here. Anyway. Um, so anyway, at the end of the day, if you're feeling, you know, stuck in act two, just look at the following three things. Um, how active is your protagonist? Uh, you can also ask that about your antagonist, by the way, but no matter what, it's worth asking yourself how active your protagonist is just in terms of going after their goal. Are they taking actual action in order to achieve it in a way that feels authentic to their current emotional state? Ask yourself that question. Next, ask yourself if you put enough obstacles in their way. If you haven't, maybe there's room for a subplot that will directly impact the story and their arc. Uh, for instance, you know, you've got Richard's whole nine steps program and the thing with Stan Grossman. That is a subplot. Uh, it's not the main plot. The main plot is getting Olive to Little Miss Sunshine pageant. Um, but the subplot of Stan Grossman and the Nine Steps program is so integral to his character that it's easy to forget that. Um, but it gives him a lot to do. And uh, just as importantly, it raises the stakes for him. Uh, low point demonstration for this class. You know what? It's the perfect time, right? Like, you know, classes 13 through 15 are going to be the third act. So I, I think I'm doing a really good job here. Um, anyway, so um, the subplot for Richard, it raises the stakes for him. And that's the final thing, right? So just ask yourself if you're regularly increasing the stakes enough. And in, in case it's unclear, just that simply means raising the meaning of their success or the consequences of their failure or both. So when the second act started for Richard, it was just about like getting his daughter to a pageant and uh, teaching her a life lesson about winning, right? Like that's what it was about for him. And that was enough to get him going. But by the, the time the second act ends, his marriage, his relationship with his kids, his entire sense of self-worth have all been put into jeopardy because of this whole journey that they're in. And so to him, it feels like everything. It feels like almost life or death going into this third act. Um, if you're already past a lot of these points in your script and you know you just feel inspired to go back and change things. Um, so first of all, let me say like that's normal and okay. Um, that's part of the process every single time we write something through multiple revisions. I do wanna say just get this first draft done first. There's gonna be plenty of time to go back and revise it later, but you can't revise something if it's not fully written. So um, finish out this draft, and then if you have time, go back and do it after. Um, and we'll talk about rewriting in a couple weeks, by the way. Um, so that's kind of it for today. A uh, brief reminder just about the cost of the course. So first of all, keep doing the work. Uh, you are almost there. You are very close to having completed a feature screenplay. It's a rare and wonderful thing. The feeling of it is just like absolutely awesome. And I can't wait for you to experience that for yourself. So just stay the course. Um, second, if you're getting value out of these videos and these classes, uh, just share them with a friend or on social media. Uh, I will be pulling them down in late February, and I just would love for other people to have an opportunity to take advantage of them before then. And then third and finally, uh, it's a free course. I don't want anybody to feel obligated to pay a dime, but if you do feel inclined to tip something, uh, that's certainly appreciated. Uh, and I thank you very much for it. Uh, you can do that at Venmo at nate-davis-64. Nate or on PayPal at NathanGrahamDavis at Gmail. And that's it. So week 12 assignments, uh, keep up with your pages, 10 to 15 this week. Uh, and part two, uh, just think about movies with like super active protagonists, especially in the second act. Find a script for one of those and read it. Uh, just paying attention to what it is that they do to achieve their goal and how that maintains momentum throughout the second act. Uh, and that is it for today's class. Um, so let's hear what you got for questions. Questions about, uh, you know, anything that we've talked about thus far today or just where you're at in your script, uh, following up on things that we talked about with networking last week, you know, whatever you got.
Oh, good. I'm glad you got something out of this one. That's great. You know, it's, it was interesting trying to like figure out how to structure the whole course here because like a lot of this information might have felt like it'd be helpful earlier on, but at the same time, like I wanted to make sure that you had enough, you know, foundational stuff to at least allow you to start writing. Um, and the thing is, like, we always do so much rewriting anyway in any script. Like, I don't think it hurts you to kind of get some of these additional details later. Um, but like, you know, it is like the second act is a challenge. And so I certainly relate to that for, uh, for anybody who's having a challenge with that right now. Um, so I'm glad that you found it helpful. But come on, I know somebody's got to have a question. This can't be the first class with zero questions. Or maybe it can be, I don't know. Yeah, that's the trick, absorbing it and using it. It's like, I mean, like, you know, I have to kind of like relearn things all the time. Uh, so, you know, I, like even, I think I mentioned it, but even doing this class, like there are certain concepts where maybe I kind of had them instinctually as I've written things, but like having to actually articulate them and kind of put them out in a way that is understandable was useful for me to just kind of make certain things more uh, concrete for myself. So uh, for Little Miss Sunshine, We've talked a bit about Olive owning the central goal for the movie, but she's not really the active protagonist. How often is that kind of this kind of a thing? Um, it's not common. Uh, you know, typically you've got like one protagonist who's the active person and it's kind of their flaw um, that is kind of driving the whole and it's their car character arc driving everything. But like it does happen. And, you know, Little Miss Sunshine is more of an ensemble movie. And so it works really well. Um, to have kind of two characters who are kind of owning uh, the whole protagonist thing. And so Olive is the protagonist in certain ways and Richard is in other ways. Um, and like they kind of complete each other in making the story work. My brain is full. I understand it all, but trying to put it on the page. Yeah, that, you know, welcome to the, the challenge of being a writer. Uh, I relate. I wonder if it's, if it's possible to have a passive protagonist still create a compelling narrative. Has that ever happened? Uh, yes, I'm sure there are compelling narratives with passive protagonists. I'm sure we're all aware of a few too. Um, I can't really think of any right now. I mean, like, I think if I remember right, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, it's pretty uh, passive protagonist. Uh, there's enough going on there that it made for a super entertaining and successful movie. I don't think it would get remade like that now. Um, you know, but like, that's an example of one, I think, uh, you know, it's not common. Uh, typically, you know, people, people go to stories, uh, and, and they, they, they enjoy stories that, uh, often suggest like that people can change. And in order to prove that a protagonist can change or that somebody else in the story can change, uh, they need to be active and they need to, uh, be, you know, going toward a goal and learning things as a result of it. Um, so are there examples of passive protagonists that work? I'm sure there are, but like, it's pretty uncommon. Typically you want an active protagonist. Uh, for obstacles, any tips on making obstacles not feel like they just come out of nowhere or seem forced? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Like, so, you know, start with your protagonist and your like antagonist antagonistic force, right? So, you know, in Castaway, for instance, the antagonistic force is like the island and, and the wilderness, right? And so all these things happen to Tom Hanks that you could kind of say come out of nowhere, but like not really because they're all related to the concept and the antagonistic force on the island. Um, and so nothing kind of feels like it's like unmotivated or unearned. Um, but like, if you had something happen where like it felt completely out of left field, like let's say a second plane crashed into the island or something and kind of screwed everything up for him, like that would feel like a little bit odd uh, and not as cohesive with it. Um, so, you know, with a person who's an antagonist, I think it's even easier because you can have them doing things to try and foil the protagonist. And then you have the protagonist do things to try and like overcome those obstacles and the antagonist has to step up their game and create more obstacles. Um, and so, you know, that helps. Um, and a lot of that comes with just kind of 
like how you set up the movie. So in if I'm thinking about like Die Hard, like, you know, John McClane's like obstacles like that he has to overcome are all based on like at first kind of he's running uh, and then he's actually going after them. Um, but like all the, the things that in, are in his way all feel like they're related to the concept. So you've got, you know, the the villains have set things up in a way where the authorities aren't willing to believe that something's wrong. They're, they've already kind of figured out how to overcome that and that makes it tough for John um, and so on and so forth. Uh, I have seen ideas, but don't know where to put them. Should I write them and uh, stick them somewhere later? Yeah, I mean like, so Herb, I don't know if you're using a scratch doc kind of like I suggested in the beginning of the course, but that's where I put stuff. Like if I'm like, hmm, this is a good idea. I don't know exactly how I'm going to use it yet, but like, I just want to keep it in mind for later. I just put stuff like that into my scratch doc and make sure that I don't lose it. Cause um, if you don't write it down, you probably will forget it if you're anything like me. Uh, I have lost my ending after veering from my outline so much, but I'm still writing. That happens. Um, should I stop until I have a concrete ending or continue writing to see if an ending comes to me? Um, great question. I think either thing can work. Um, personally, I feel uncomfortable writing without at least a pretty good idea of where it's ending. I've definitely had that happen where as a result of what I've been writing, like the characters and the story clearly want to go in a different direction and I go off outline and then it's clear that the ending is going to be some something different and I'm not sure what it is yet. Um, and so I will typically try and figure out what that ending is before I go any further. Oftentimes it doesn't take me that long, like, you know, putting a couple hours into it, at least like I'll have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. And between all the other work that I've done, that pretty good idea is usually enough to keep me going. There are other people who write without an ending in mind. I don't know how they do that, especially not in a screenplay where so much depends on structure. For me, like having that ending like that I'm working toward is really helpful. Um, and But, you know, everybody's got a different process. So, you know, I would say, especially if this is your first script, Michael, I think the important thing is to prove to yourself that you can finish it. So maybe spend a little bit of time trying to figure out that ending, but don't invest so much that you lose all your writing momentum. Um, really try and hold yourself accountable to just putting in the time to, to, on pages so that you can actually finish this draft because there's just a lot of power that comes in proving to yourself that you can finish it and like you can always revise it as much as you need to later. Um, Carol, my protagonist has a best friend who helps her by giving her advice. How much of a subplot could this friend have? Suggestions of her problems or a full-blown development or hints throughout script? Um, yeah, so I mean, like, you could go in any number of directions with that. Um, so let's, like, just go back to Little Miss Sunshine because we were just talking about it. So the mentor figure in that is, is Grandpa. Um, and he's, you know, he plays a huge part in that story, even though he dies on page 60. So, like, he's the one who came up with all of his dance routine that pays off in the end. He's the one that's telling all of, like, hey, just, you know, the fact that you're trying is enough. He's the one that kind of, like, um, gives Richard the idea that like there's reason to be proud of himself um, and he also did stuff like you know he was the one who told Frank to go buy him porn magazines that got him out of trouble with his own dead body in the car later um, and so you know there's a lot that you can do with those characters I think at the end of the day like what you want is you want them to feel more than just like a flat character that's just inserted in there to just give advice right like you want to like make them feel well-rounded and like they've got some depth and they have um, some meaning to them. And usually as a result of just doing that, a few ideas will come out uh, and you'll be like, oh, I know how to set this up and pay this off later so that it just kind of is more satisfying and more interesting. Um, but like, you know, it's without knowing more about like the particulars of your story, it'd be hard to say exactly how to take that. But like you can do a lot just by investing time and trying to flesh out that character and learn more about what makes them interesting and unique and then building out a couple things from that. Um, are you wary of flashback overdose? I have so much backstory that establishes context for present day. I'm struggling with this. I've never heard that term, but I can totally understand what it means. So like if you have like a typical narrative structure and you do a lot of flashing back, 
that can kill momentum. Um, and at the same time, if you have characters just constantly talking about backstory, that can be boring. And so it can be tricky to figure out like how to establish all that backstory without um, killing the momentum with flashbacks or, uh, you know, do, just being boring with a lot of exposition. Um, I don't do a lot of flashing back. Exposition is like something is a skill that you get better at over time the more that you practice it. And that's probably something worth talking about a little bit more. Um, the, the trick with exposition is you have to come up with a motivated reason for a character to talk about something. They can talk about something directly if there's a good reason for them to do it. But you never want like a character to tell another character something that they would probably already know anyway. Because then it, you don't want it to feel like it's there for the benefit of the audience. You want it to feel like it's an authentic conversation. But let's say like you manage to make a character really curious about another character's backstory. Well, if that character is genuinely curious, the audience is probably genuinely curious too. And now you can actually have your character directly talk about something without it feeling forced or on the nose because that curiosity is there. So curiosity is really powerful. You still got to find a way to do it in a way that's lean um, so that it doesn't, you know, you're not sitting there for two pages talking about it. But like a lot of times by just making another character genuinely curious, you can accomplish a lot in terms of getting exposition out there. That's one of many ways to do it, but um, it's a trick that works well. Um, one thing I'm struggling with right now is how much to track the B-plot, secondary characters. Should B-plot follow the same arc you've mentioned here? Are they just compressed mini stories? I mean, you can do it in so many different ways. Um, I know Save the Cat has like a very particular structure for how to like kind of put the B story in there. Um, I don't even remember what it is because I never, these days I never think in terms of like A story, B story, C story. Like I'm thinking in terms of like who my characters are, what they want, what they want to get, and like just how all those things are going to play with each other. But it doesn't mean that it's not helpful to like have like some sort of template and just like just to at least get the ideas flowing. Um, just like what we're talking about here with the second act. Like, I mean, you may find that like you're able to do an outline that perfectly matches with everything that I just showed you. And then by the time you write it and rewrite it five times, like it, like some of that will be there, but not all of it. And that's OK. Um, so like sometimes a template can be useful. So what I would say is because like I off the top of my head, I, I couldn't give you a good idea for like a template for B stories. But like if you have Save the Cat or like, you know, just you can pick it up at a library really easily like that might give you a template that's useful if you want to think in those terms. But like a B story can be anything. It can run from like the first act to the middle of the second act, like Richards with Stan Grossman, or it could start it on like page 40 and run all the way until like the middle of the third act. Um, you know, different things play out that way. Like Dwayne and Frank and Little Miss Sunshine, they both kind of have the completion of their own arcs and in the middle of the third act, kind of before we get to that final moment at the at the uh, pageant. Um, and it's really effective the way that it plays out. So like you could look at that too and just kind of see how their arcs have been set up. Um, let's see. Aspects of my whip I found uniquely cool have turned up in streaming series and even in the title of a competition winner. How did you get past the blow of seeing multiple action scripts on a bridge? Oh, I'm glad that you, all right. So. Um, yeah, so like AJ say here, uh, my movie Aftermath, it's an action movie on a bridge. Um, when I first wrote that, I was in the middle of the third draft and um, I found out that a, another movie that was an action movie set on a bridge had just sold and for like 250 grand or something like that. And so it was like kind of a big deal. Um, it was in deadline and everything. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, that sucks. I just wasted six months of my life on something that's useless. Thankfully, I knew a couple pro writers at the time who had read this and they were like, no, dude, this is good. Keep going with it. Don't give up. Um, and I didn't. And it became a movie eventually. Um, so it's tricky because like there are certain like if something is is so unique or like 
becomes massively big, like it can be tough to like overcome parallel development. Um, but like if it's the type of idea that could be executed in multiple different ways, like then I wouldn't let it get in your way. Um, there are certainly examples of like, you know, times when like two movies very similar to each other have come out because people or studios have been in competition. Um, you know, you've got your Deep Impact and Armageddon. There were like two volcano movies that came out at the same time. Um, you know, you've got uh, all sorts of examples of those over the years. For you, like you're talking about a competition winner. That's just not a big deal. Um, like you have no idea what's going to happen with that script. Um, it, so, I, you know, for that writer, I hope something great happens for them. But at the same time, like, you know, this is everything is a long shot in this business. I would never let something like that hold you back. Um, in terms of a streaming series, I wouldn't let that hold you back either because there are so many streaming series out there right now. Hardly, it feels like hardly anybody is aware of everything going on in every streaming series. Like there are, you know, if it's Stranger Things, you probably shouldn't try and do another Stranger Things. But if it's like the 50th thing that just came out in the last week that like three or four people are talking about online, it's probably going to be forgotten about in a month. So I wouldn't let, I wouldn't worry too much about that either. Um, especially if they're not just like, you, if they're unique elements and not the core concept of it. Um, I have a tendency to write short first drafts and this one is looking the same. Do you uh, find people who write short uh, have any common problems? Well, good question. Um, I have had that problem myself in the past. Um, and it typically, I've, I've found that it typically comes from not doing enough work and kind of like figuring out who my characters are. Um, and because like a lot of times you're able to develop obstacles and things like that, that lead to additional sequences or longer sequences simply by knowing your characters better. Um, and this includes like the antagonistic characters. Um, you know, it, so I, I would say like, see, start with character uh, as you go back to revise and like see what you can do by fleshing them out and what other things you can explore. And if those would lead to not just interesting things that you can put in the movie, but like interesting conflict that is not in the movie already. Um, the other thing to do is to add a character or two. Um, if you can add a character or two um, that feel like there, there's a really good and motivated reason to put them in there, that will add a whole lot of additional conflict and um, you know opportunities for dramatic tension and obstacles um, even if they're on the protagonist side like it just like by putting them in there if they're a fleshed out character you should be able to create new opportunities there um, that will kind of build the movie out so like i would look at those things um you know it's it can be hard like especially if you're writing something that's contained um, with, you know, very few characters and, and, and very few locations, you know, finding a way to get a full length script out of that takes some work. And sometimes you just got to kind of keep messing with it and, and really digging into the material to find out like what else is here, what else is interesting about it. I have dual antagonists, uh, maybe a little like the cops and Hans and Die Hard. I find it hard to balance them. Um, what are some pitfalls and things to watch out for in this situation? So, okay. So, you know, I think um, the first thing that I would say is most likely you're going to be best served by having one of them be the true antagonist, right? So like um, Hans is no, no question is like the true antagonist of Die Hard. Like the cops are an obstacle, um, but like, and like absolutely are they antagonistic? Totally. Um, but like, they're just kind of like getting in the way and they also are at odds with Hans to some degree. So like there is a triangle going on there. So you might want to see, is there a way to kind of do the same thing in your script if you're not doing that already, where like there's one very specific antagonist, there's one very specific protagonist, and then this other like antagonistic force is kind of like the third point of the triangle where they're at odds with both of them. Um, that's That can make things really interesting conflict-wise. Um, and will also help you just be more clear on kind of where to take things in terms of the story's progression. Um, same question, but for protagonist, any dual protagonist tips? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, typically like there is one protagonist 
that's going to be the more active one. But like you do have examples of like two-hander romantic comedies, buddy movies where like you could kind of say it's really both of them. Um, and in that case, like you just need to make sure that they both got like arcs uh, that they need to complete. Um, and like you also want to, they might have the same goal but you want to give them perspectives that put them at odds with each other so that like it creates natural conflict as they're going through the story. Like if they're constantly on the same page the entire time, why have two protagonists? Um, like it's just like that's kind of going to get boring. You want them to be in conflict with each other so that they're kind of additional obstacles and antagonistic forces to each other. Um, and that, But like ideally as a result of their arcs completing and them both realizing their flaws, they're able to come together in the third act in a way that's really, really satisfying. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Is there such a thing as too short of a scene of a few scenes that are only half page long? No, that's fine. I do that all the time. I think it can be really useful to have short scenes um, pacing wise, uh, especially depending on genre. But like, you know, it's like pacing should have like a feel of flow, right? Like it should, it's possible to make something feel too choppy. And I think that's something that you do develop an instinct for over time. But like, as it, so it kind of should just feel like that right like it like uh, a roller coaster or whatever and like at certain points in that roller coaster you're going to have really short scenes and those are going to help you kind of amp up the tension okay cool i'm glad that was helpful Do you have any more screenplay recommendations for movies that mix action and dialogue well? I find myself having lots of action, then lots of dialogue, and it's hard to put them together seamlessly. Um, let's see. I mean, it's also it also comes down to kind of like the tone that you're looking for, but like, I feel like like things that come to mind are are like classics, like you know, or it's funny to call Born Identity a classic, but I think of Born Identity like you know, the car chase in that like has dialogue in there, but like it just, uh, it works really well and you care about the characters as the car chase is going on. Um, you know, like, I'm trying to think of other action movies where the dialogue is like really good during the action sequences. Um, I think Christopher Nolan's, like a lot of, like his kind of more action uh, packed movies do that pretty well. Um, so maybe kind of take a look at like his Batman's or Inception. Um, you might find that that's kind of useful. Uh, what are your thoughts on montage sequences? Short scene without dialogue to condensing compact plot points. Uh, so I think montages can be useful. Um, you risk like it coming across as lazy. So I guess like if you can find a way to cut around like stuff that would be boring on screen, do it. Whether it's, you know, completely just cutting it in general and kind of implying that that thing happened on the other side of it in the next scene. Um, sometimes montages can kind of do that as well. Um, but like, you know, if it would be boring to show it all, that's, that's a good reason to kind of find a way around that. If the audience is going to really want to see something, like, you know, you might want to like, find a reason to actually show that whole thing in a scene or or develop a whole scene that'll include all those same montage elements um but montages can be great like they can also be really fun and funny too like depending on what you manage to put in there um but like the point of them is that they're they typically try and take this long period of time where like it would be boring to show most of the things and then they just kind of highlight the most interesting elements of that and so as long as you can make everything in that montage like really interesting and it's there, there's a really good motivated reason to use it then yeah i mean it's it's a useful tool 
Oh, Die Hard with a Vengeance and Rush Hour would be really good. And those are like obviously different tonally, um, but like, yeah, I think um, those are both really fun. Uh, yeah, any um, any Shane Black script really, you know, is a he he's just known for being super fun in the way that he does uh, both action and dialogue. So like that might be worth reading. Um, any thoughts on subtext? How to balance steering away from the exposition dump without being sure what's in your mind has made it to the page. Um, so like. I never really make subtext the goal. Good dialogue does often have a lot of subtext, but it's more that like what you're aiming for is authentic conversations between characters. And so, or like, so like they're motivated authentically and they're not telling each other things that they would already know. And quite often, like because of how they're feeling emotionally, they're saying things in a way that's a little bit guarded or cagey or passive aggressive or whatever. So it's not, it's not direct, but again, it's, it's rooted in everything that's happened so far and who they are as a person in their backstory and their emotional state at the start of that scene. I do think one of the best things that you can do, and I have to like remind myself this all the time is like when I'm working on a scene, asking myself, like, what are the characters emotional states at the beginning of this scene is so helpful in terms of like both guiding their actions, but also especially the things that they say. So um, like if you do that and you focus on the characters and their emotional states, I think subtext just kind of comes out naturally. Like again, like I don't ever make subtext the goal. Um, throughout act two, uh, how do you make it organic uh, and not make it so obvious? Like meaning in beats and transitions just flow scene to scene um so that has a lot to do again with like making sure that your characters are active right so like if your protagonist and your antagonist have very specific goals that they're after and they're taking action toward those goals like they're going to get in each other's ways and so like that will feel organic and like and if you set those things up correctly and kind of like give the antagonistic force or the antagonist everything that they need to kind of get in the protagonist's way, you'll be able to create these big plot points, but like they'll just be a result of the actions that the antagonist is taking. In addition, if you set up the protagonist in a way that like they've got these different elements to them, right? And these other things that are already going on. Um, so like Richard and Little Miss Sunshine, like he already was doing this big winning program that was set up in the first act and it was an important part to who he was in his whole character arc, but it also gave something really important, like to go wrong in the, in part of the, the uh, second act so that it raised the stakes for everything. So it's all about, it's all about being true to like your characters, making sure that they're actively pursuing their goals and just setting them up with enough in the first act so that like they'll naturally cause those problems and you're not just kind of throwing stuff in there. Face off and nice guys, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I would, I'll tell you what. Like, I think the one thing that, like, I think ChatGPT is actually great for is movie suggestions. So, like, if you go into ChatGPT and be like, give me, like, you know, 15 action movies that do X, Y, Z, it'll, like, spit out a list like that. And then you go and you watch the movies and read the scripts and you write your own thing. And, you know, I, I never use ChatGPT for any writing stuff, but, like, for research type stuff it can actually be pretty useful so like i don't think it's evil for that type of thing at all anybody else got any questions right now what else what else can i help you with No problem. It's fun. How important is it to remove grammar arrows and typos in early drafts? Uh, okay. If you're asking for early feedback, great question. Okay. Um, so I, I hate sending people stuff that's littered with typos. Like if I'm going to send somebody a draft to read for feedback, I want them to feel, to get it 
and to get the impression that I really put work into like making it as good as possible before I sent it. Um, and so I do like try and hunt down typos and stuff and like the way that I do it. And I'm going to talk about rewriting, like I'm going to take a whole class to do that basically. Um, but the way that I do that is I print out a draft every single time and I go through it with like a bright colored pen so that I won't miss it. And I hunt down typos. Um, and I will tell you, I miss them every single time. It's infuriating. I remember one time, and this was like 10 years ago where I sent somebody a draft, like an early one. And they were like, holy shit, I can't believe there were zero typos in this. It's the only time it's ever happened. Usually I'll get notes back and they'll like point out five or six of them. And it makes me want to tear my hair out because of how hard I looked for them. So like, don't freak out if they're in there. But like, if you're going to ask somebody to like put in four hours of their time or whatever into reading your script, thinking about it and giving you notes, it's worth putting in the time to make it as clean as possible for them. Just it's a, to me, it's a sign of respect. Have you ever changed a feature idea to a series idea when you are overflowing with ideas and characters and backstories? No, but that, but like a lot of writers do. And I think it's totally reasonable. The, there's a very real reason that I don't do that. Uh, and it's because like, I, you know, don't write TV. I, I live in Massachusetts. I don't plan to move to LA and still, for the most part, if you want to write TV, you kind of need to be in LA or like wherever there's a writer's room. So for me, like I, I focus on movies, but it doesn't mean I'll never do something like that in the future. A good tip for finding them is to read your script backwards. It interrupts. That's a good idea. I, I read stuff out loud a lot and I find that helps as well. But yeah, reading backwards is actually a really good idea. By the way, reading out loud, um, I think that's like one of the best things you can do to find out if your dialogue uh, sounds okay. It's just kind of like reading it out loud. Um, and I, it, I do it so often that I just do it naturally uh, and like kind of whispering uh, a lot of the times while I'm writing. My wife says it sounds like parcel tongue uh, and I don't even know I'm doing it. Um, and I, I think I tend to freak people out when I'm working in coffee shops, but oh well. <laughs> I removed the last question because I made a typo. If you let your software read it, they jump out too. That's a great idea. I bet that does work. You know, I never take advantage of that as like having the uh, software read, but it's probably a really good idea and something that I should do more often. Other questions? Cool, well we can uh, wrap up for today. Uh, thank you all, uh, I'm excited uh, that it's going so well. Uh, it's so cool to see uh, so many of you, you know, are so far into your scripts now or have even finished them. It's really, really awesome and exciting for me. Uh, so I think uh, the Discord is happening directly after this. I'm going to try and jump in there for a little bit just to, to say what's up and kind of listen in more instead of talk. Um, and uh, other than that, I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks so much.